Hi, welcome to AP Calculus for East Aurora High School. In this lesson, we're going to review inverse functions. So given the function represented by the ordered pairs, and you can see that I've listed down a set of ordered pairs, f of x is equal to negative 2, 4, negative 1, 7, 3, 5, 0, 1, and 6, negative 3. If this is our function, then the inverse function is going to be denoted by the notation, remember how we write inverses, f to the minus 1 of x. That stands for the inverse function of f. Now if I'm taking an inverse function, an inverse function is simply a reflection over the line y equals x. So that just means that for every ordered pair in the original function, to find the inverse function, all I need to do is reverse the x and the y coordinates. So I'm going to write down my inverse function as also a set of ordered pairs. So f inverse is going to be the set of ordered pairs for negative 2, 7, negative 1, 5, comma 3, 1, 0, and negative 3, 6. So the inverse function is simply reversing the x and the y coordinates. So here's some of the important information that we should know already about inverses. If g is the inverse function of f, then f must be the inverse function of g. Functions are inverses of each other. If we talk about the domain of the inverse function, the domain of the inverse function is equal to the range of the original function. And the range of the inverse function is equal to the domain of the original function. Number three, a function g is the inverse function of the function f whenever we do a composition and f of g of x brings us back to the value x but I can also go the other way and say g of f of x also brings me back to x. So for example, if I am starting with x and I plug it into the function g first of all, then what I get is a value g of x. But then if I take that function or that value g of x and I plug it back into f, which is the inverse function, that's going to bring me back to my value x. That's the definition of an inverse function. Now let's recall how to find an inverse function. If I'm given the equation for a function, and again, I know that it's a function because it's past the vertical line test. To find the inverse of that function, the first step is going to be to switch the x and the y variable. And then my second step is going to be to solve for the y. So if I do that, once I've solved for y, that is the answer for the inverse function equation. So let's try one of these. Let's say that I'm starting with my function f of x is equal to 2x to the third minus 1. And I want to find the inverse. So, to find the inverse, let's look at my original function. I'm going to write it as y equals instead so that I've got the variables y and x. So this would just be the same as y equals 2x to the third minus 1. So to find the inverse, step number 1 is going to be to switch the x and the y. So I'm going to say this becomes x equals 2 y to the third minus 1. And now I'm going to solve for the y. So to solve for the y, I'm going to add 1 to both sides of the equation. I'm going to divide both sides by 2, and I'm going to reverse the sides here so that I can get the y by itself. So I'm going to have y cubed is equal to x plus 1 over 2. And then let's finish it off by saying that we need the cube root. So y is going to be equal to the cube root of x plus 1 over 2. 
Now again, another way of writing that would be the inverse function. So f inverse of x would be equal to the cube root of x plus 1 over 2. And there's my inverse function. Now we also should know that a function has an inverse function if and only if the original function f is a one-to-one -one function. And recall that to test whether a function is one-to-one, -one, we are going to use the horizontal line test. So we all know that to test if something is a function, we're going to use the vertical line test. And if something is a one-to-one -one function, it first of all has to pass the vertical line test to be a function, but then it's got to pass the horizontal line test to be one-to-one. Now in AP Calculus, we'll be dealing with all kinds of functions and their inverses. But some of the important ones that you might not recall as well from pre-calculus are the exponential and the logarithmic functions. So in Section 5 in your textbook, they will take a look and explain some more about exponential and log functions. Here I'm just going to briefly go over some of the important properties of the exponential and log functions. So first of all, you see that if I have an exponential graph, I've drawn two different exponential graphs here. The first one, the blue one, is going to be one representing exponential growth. Now I know that it's exponential growth because the graph gets bigger as x gets bigger. So as the graph progresses to the right, the y values get bigger and bigger. Now what we know for an exponential growth graph is that the b value is going to be greater than 1. So if I have the equation y is equal to a times b to the x as my exponential graph, then as long as b is greater than 1, it will be exponential growth. For the red graph, I see that this one should be exponential decay. This is going to be exponential decay because as x gets bigger, the y value is getting smaller. In this case, I see that my b value is less than 1. So again, it would have the form y equals a times b to the x. Now an example of this graph might be y is equal to 2 times 1 third to the x power. So again, you'll notice that the base value is less than 1, creating an exponential decay graph. We are, of course, also going to be working with the graph of y equals e to the x quite a bit in calculus. And since e is a value that's greater than 1, that graph is going to look like the blue one, the exponential growth graph. Now here are some of the most important properties of our exponential functions. For um, the domain, the domain of, and it didn't print out here, so I'm going to print them in, f of x equals a to the x, or g of x equals e to the x, could be my functions. The domain is going to be all real numbers. So all real numbers, we could say everything from negative infinity to positive infinity. And again, dealing with the same functions here, the range, for some reason my video skipped the math notation here, f of x equals a to the x, and g of x equals b to the x, I'm sorry, e to the x. The range for this one is going to be y is greater than 0. All of my y values will be positive. The y-intercept of these two graphs is always going to be the point 0, 1 if there's no coefficient in front of the exponential. If there is a coefficient in front of the exponential, then that coefficient will be my y-intercept. Lastly, these two functions are 1 to 1 because they do pass the horizontal line test. They are functions because they pass the vertical line test, but they're also 1 to 1 functions. One other important thing that I forgot to type in here, but it is important to note, these graphs, these exponential graphs, have horizontal asymptotes. 
And as long as there has not been a vertical shift of my graph by adding or subtracting a constant to the exponential, the vertical asymptote is going to occur at y equals 0. So my graph is not going to touch the x-axis, but it will approach the x-axis. Let's take a look at the natural log function. Now our natural log function, of course, is important because it is the inverse of the graph of f of x equals e to the x. Now our definition of the natural log function, it is the inverse of e to the x. The natural log of x is defined as the natural log of x is equal to b if and only if x is equal to e to the b. The domain for our natural log function from 0 to infinity, the range from negative infinity to infinity. So you'll recall that when I have inverses, the domain of the inverse function is the range of the original, and the range of the inverse function is the domain of the original. So that shows what we saw above. Here we have our graph, and let's start with our graph of our exponential function. So we know that the exponential y equals e to the x looks like this. And again, our y equals e to the x function, or f of x equals e to the x, is completely above the x-axis. Now if I go to do the inverse, if I flip this graph over the diagonal line y equals x. So remember that your diagonal line would cut my quadrants right in half like this. So my inverse function is going to look like this. So the red graph is going to be the reflection of the blue over the dotted line, and that gives me the graph of y equals the natural log of x. These two graphs should be common knowledge for you after going through pre-calculus. The x-intercept of the natural log function is going to be the same as the y-intercept of my exponential function, but again, remember you have to reverse your x and your y-coordinates. So the x-intercept is going to be 1, 0. You'll see that right here on my graph. There's 1, 0. On my exponential, the y-intercept was 0, 1. So again, just a reminder that f of x equals e to the x and g of x equals the natural log of x are inverse functions. That then uh, gives us two pieces of information. First of all, if I take the natural log of e to the x, the natural log and the e, because they're inverse functions, cancel each other out, and that just gives me the value x. Secondly, if I take e to the natural log of x, that's also going to give me the answer of x, because the e and the natural log will cancel each other out. So e to the x and natural log of x are really important inverse functions that we'll be working with throughout this year. Lastly, let's remember the important properties of logarithms. I'm going to write them as natural log, but remember that these properties also apply if I've got log to a base other than e. So again, remember the natural log is log to the base e. A, the product law just says, or the product property, sorry, says the natural log of x times y, because I've got a product there, recall our rules for exponents. That just comes from the natural log of x plus the natural log of y. So when I have a product, then I'm going to break that up. I'm going to uh, expand it into the natural log of x plus the natural log of y. The quotient property says that if I've got the natural log of x divided by y, that's going to be the natural log of x minus the natural log of y. So when we have exponentials and we're dividing with our exponentials, remember that all we do is really subtract the exponents. It's exactly why we do this with logs, because logs are just exponents. The power rule says that if I've got the natural log of x raised to the p power, I can take that power and move it out in front as a coefficient. So it becomes p times the natural log of x. So these three properties of logarithms are going to be useful to us as well all the way through AP Calculus. 
Thanks very much for reviewing inverse uh, functions with me today. Hopefully it was a good reminder for you to uh, be able to move on through this course. Have a great day. Bye-bye.